Welcome. Today's episode is brought to you by the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Ag and Human Resources and the Livestock Extension Group. Aloha and welcome to the Livestock Lala'au, a podcast aimed to provide educational support, information, guidance, and outreach to livestock stakeholders in Hawaii. We are your hosts, Mele Oshiro and Shannon Sand. Today, we're going to discuss the two-line spittlebug. To do that, we're going to introduce you to the range, pasture, and livestock specialist for the University of Hawaii, Dr. Mark Thorne. So I'm excited to introduce you to our colleague and one of the first person, people, that I've worked for in extension. Uh, I've known Mark for about 10 plus years now. Seems really long when I say that, Mark. I didn't realize I actually knew you that long. Um, but uh, so we worked on very uh, a lot of multiple projects um, with him. And one of the one of the things I think stood out with me when I first worked was the large project we had with the Pacific Island Outreach folks and uh, working with numerous producers, extension folks, other government agencies, and uh, looking at tropical pasture and livestock management. I'm going to let Mark tell us a little bit more about how he came to be a specialist for the University of Hawaii. First of all, thank you guys for having me on for your while well, uh podcast i i'm really honored to be here and and um i think um i think what you're doing with this is really a great thing so i wish you a lot of luck and success with this thank you thank you for thank coming you. on yes yeah. thanks for being here yes. yeah so to give you a little bit of background um you know i it, so i grew up in wyoming so i'm i'm not a hawaii boy obviously and mm-hmm. um <laughs> I, Shucks, I, I would have never guessed that, Mark. <laughs> I, <laughs> I uh, you know, growing up in Wyoming, I spent a, a lot of time on the family ranch. I, mm-hmm. I uh, then after high school, during high school, and after high school, I worked for ranches around uh, the Western United States. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was what I was going to do, and but but life had some <laughs> other decisions for me, and um, I, after I spent about uh eight years in the marine corps i decided um in a roundabout way that i'd go to school and get into range management and so um i did my bachelor's and undergraduate my bachelor's and my master's projects at uh university of wyoming and then went to colorado state university for my phd program and i finished in 2002 and and during that 2002 period I had uh, applied for and accepted a position with Colorado State University as a range and livestock extension specialist Mm -hmm. in the southeast corner of the state Uh, but before I even started the the job um, I had also accepted an opportunity to interview for a, a job and it was here at the University of Hawaii so in December about two weeks before I was supposed to start the position in Colorado I came here to interview and so yeah so the interview um yeah I flew you know just as as an interesting aside I guess and I maybe it was maybe it was fated that I would come to the University of Hawaii yeah um when I stepped off of the airplane and stepped out of the airport Mm -hmm. I sat down on a bench waiting for uh Dr. Carpenter and Brent Buckley who were the on the committee, they were going to come pick me up at the airport. And I sat down at a bench and I, I had with me a a garment bag that I had when I was in the Marine Corps, had my, my name on scrolled across the top of it. And uh, a gentleman had come out and he was in civilian clothes, but he came in and came out and he sat down next to me. I, I didn't, wasn't really paying attention, but he had looked at my bag and he said, excuse me. He said, um, he said, he asked me if I had served in the Marine Corps. And I, I said, I said, well, yeah, I, I did. And he said, well, he was Lieutenant house. He was my last commanding officer when I was in the Marine Corps, when I just oh. from the Marine Corps, he oh, was no now a, a major. So I, awesome. it's just, a, you just imagine the, you know, the, how big of a coincidence how the serendipity of that moment Mm -hmm. i could have been five minutes late and i would have missed him but i sat there for about five minutes we talked a little bit uh back and forth and then uh dr carpenter and and brent buckley came and 
he went his way and I haven't ever seen him since, but um, I just thought that that was such a, you know, it was like, okay, there's something going on here. The yeah, media meant to be here. To be here so yeah. Um, yeah. And it was great to connect with him. And so, um, you know, so uh, that kind of set the tone for, you know, the interviews went great. Um, I, uh, I was uh, just hugely um, humbled by, you know, the, the, knowledge and the generosity and and um uh hospitality of the livestock industry in the state when i came here and you know i was taken around to the ranches on maui and the ranches on the big island and you know john pally on maui had to make sure that he introduced me to a locomoco and so <laughs> on our drive up country to go to haleakla ranch for the interview uh we stopped and had um locomocos at a little restaurant in in uh, yeah. Pukalani and and um uh so I was just uh amazed I I there were things that I saw as signs that you know um mm -hmm. th these this was the place where I needed to come mm -hmm. um I was really impressed by the diversity of the range lands here and and the ranching community and what they were dealing with and and uh their resourcefulness and so I was just really impressed. And I, um, I, I left Hawaii after three days of interviews, mm -hmm. um, kind of convinced that if I was offered the position, I would take it. And yeah. um, uh, only a week after I interviewed, um, they called me back and offered me the position. And, um, and I, I accepted, there was a little bit of negotiation back and forth on, on startup packages and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, but they, but the university met everything, everything I asked for. And, and so I thought, well, this is where I've got to go. And, um, so, uh, in the meantime, I still had, I had another started, job. <laughs> I still hadn't started the, the position at Colorado state. And so I, I felt obligated to at least um, at least show up in Rocky Ford for a, a month or two. And so I, my start date wasn't until August 1st of 2003. Ah. But uh, and I did uh, go to Rocky Ford and I was in Rocky Ford from January till till July and um, and, and did that job there. So, nice. um, yeah, I came here and, you know, uh, you know, John Powley and uh, Glenn Fukumoto and Lincoln Ching, all uh, now retired livestock mm -hmm. extension agents, but had been in the in their positions for a long time, um, you know, really took me under their wing and and uh, mm -hmm. taught me a lot about extension and, um, you know, collaboration and working together. So um, and and really helped me get my feet on the ground in terms of establishing a, a range and livestock program. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been my predecessor, um, Bert Smith had left in 2000. So it had been about three years since the position had been filled. Oh wow! And um, so, you know, there was a, there was a to do and um, I had to learn about, you know, what uh, so I had a, you know, I had a lot to, to learn and um I mean, I, I'm, I feel like I'm still learning uh, over here and I've been here. This is now my, I'm into my 18th year or yeah, I'll be in 18th year, uh, August 1st. So, um, wow. uh, so it's, I, I feel like I'm still learning and, uh, you know, the learning curve was really steep coming here and, and, um, Hawaii is very unique. I mean, you know, range management practices and principles are the same. They, they're applied across all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. ecological systems, but um, there's some very unique aspects to Hawaii. And I, I, I felt like it was going to be a, a, tr a challenge to me personally, mm -hmm. and it has been, and, and very much worth the challenge. Um, so I was excited to come here and learn nice. and uh, work within the livestock community and, and, um, and develop a program that I, that I felt was, you know, um, worthy of, of the, of the industry here. I don't know that I've ever fully met everybody's expectations. I hope that I've fulfilled some, <laughs> I hope that I've, 
<laughs> that I've provided something lasting here, uh, you know, in the time that I've been here so far. And, um, you know, um, I, I would like to, I'm not anywhere near retirement at this point, but uh, by the time <laughs> I retire, I'd like to think that I, I contributed something to the industry, you know, down the road. So. Yeah, well, I want to say like just, you know, I thought being that I was born and raised here that we knew a lot. I knew a lot about our pastures and rangelands and stuff. And I got to tell you, working for Mark, I mean, Mark, you have, I, I've learned so much more, you know, and there's so much more to it than just thinking about it as a, you know, I mean, it is the Malka and Makai sections, you know, it's always going to be very different, but there's also so much more in between all of that, that I think is really important, but yeah, but so I it's. I would just quickly say that whatever whatever I have been able to accomplish here has been has been because uh, of Mele and uh, prior to her was Matt Stevenson and uh, but Mele worked for me what nine years I think right yeah mm -hmm. and yeah that's what I was gonna say I was like she's been here almost like working with you and for you almost as long as you've been here then well yeah. I tell you what. <laughs> She could do the job. She could do my job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know no, that she, she wants. She really I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah. she's she's really she really did a great job all those years, and and you know when when the opportunity came for her to apply for the livestock extension agent oh, position, yeah. it was you know that was it was a great move for her, and it was a great it was great for the for the college to be able to to get her on board yes. as an extension yeah. agent. You know. Well, thanks. I, I, well, and it's so hard for, you know, it's so hard here because, yeah. you know, we just, we lost our extension agent on Kauai yeah. and, Italy and, you know, those are challenges that, yeah. that, um, that we have here. It's hard to retain good faculty. And, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you, I'm, and, and I'm glad that you remained a colleague and <laughs> livestock extension agent position. So, you know, now as a, time to to work together in, a, in yeah. a different capacity in a different mode and i'm i'm excited about that yeah yeah so am i and i think it's yeah it's such a great thing you know and even like working now with shannon is you know it's it's good we've gotten so much different things that we've um discussed and i'm glad that you know we've been discussing this podcast for a year so i'm yeah. glad that we're finally here doing this and i think it's going to be i hope it's going to be a great opportunity for us to continue to share yeah. our program and things uh with our stakeholders yeah. but and we do have to say a big thanks to Mark because he mm -hmm. is the head of the Livestock Extension Group yep. and gave us our kind of like first seed money to purchase all of the equipment yeah. and the software and the different things. And like he was the one that was like, when we pitched the idea to him, Mark was like, yeah, you guys should yes. do that. <laughs> so, he was very, yeah, very supportive. Yeah. So we do have to say thank you to him as yes, well because we wouldn't you. be sitting here doing our podcast otherwise. But yeah, so um, I guess that's well, another thing, you know. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great idea. And I th I think, you know, podcasts are taking off all over the country. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I have a colleague, uh, Tip Hudson, who does yep. range rangelands. His is, his is done really well and it's excellent. So... Uh, I just think this is a great opportunity and I think it's a step forward for, you know, our livestock extension community uh, to, to reach out to, in another way to our stakeholders. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I was, I'm, I'm just happy you guys had come up with the idea and, you know, yeah. just, I think it's going to be a great thing. So. Yeah. We're, we're super excited to have and get it to, you know, just to get everything going like this is just really cool. Oh yeah, we going. were in the setting up process today and it's been oh it's been so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so exciting. Yeah. It's there's so many different projects, I think, right? Going I was gonna extension. say, I was like, so what are a couple of projects over the last yeah. 18 years that you've been like that you've really enjoyed doing? What would be like a highlight if you look back? I mean, that's probably I feel like that's a really hard thing to ask. Yeah. But it's like if you had to choose a couple of them, what are some ones that you were like really enjoyed or like like I would say this, this podcast is currently for me, like a passion project and something I'm really enjoying. And maybe Melly would think that too, but like, yeah. so like over the years, what's something, what's a couple of, well, even if it's just a few, like what are one or two projects you've really enjoyed? Uh, wow. Well, I know that's I, asking I a lot. You, <laughs> no, there's been a lot of projects. Uh, yeah. Been, um, I, I, I think the, the one that I, have enjoyed the most and I, mm -hmm. that I got the most pleasure out of, uh, was our Pacific Island outreach project. And, 
you know, it, it, we had a lot of funding. We got, uh, we had three grants that covered wow. that over yeah, awesome. a span of from 2009 to 2000. 13, 14, 14, 14. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it, uh, yeah, 14, I think was yeah. the last year of our funding. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in that project, uh, you know, we, we reached out, we did work in uh, Guam, uh, the Marianas Islands, mm -hmm. um, uh, Palau, and mm -hmm. uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, um, and, and Hawaii. And we engaged livestock producers from across all of those islands. And, um, you know, we had workshops, we did research projects, we did... Um, uh, we had some comp we had a couple conferences, conferences. we brought mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. here we took people there mm -hmm. and there was just this this great interplay of all of these great wonderful livestock people from all over the islands um and yeah. i mean it, it truly that was probably the highlight of of one of the things that i had you know that we had done and as a group um we had i think at one point we had nine uh agents and specialists yeah. on board wow. as a team so i mean yep. it was very collaborative nice. uh mm -hmm. we collaborated with guam university of guam uh northern marianas college mm -hmm. uh the college in palau and mm -hmm. the college uh in, for the federated because, states of micronesia we mm -hmm. had we had people from all of those as, as part of yeah. that so cool. usually collaborative mm -hmm. um and you know we produced a lot of a lot of material mm -hmm. built a lot of good relationships Mm -hmm. that we that we still have i mean i still mm -hmm. talk with some of the folks out in the marianas islands and and guam um and um and my yeah. wife comes from guam yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well that my, means you better like it, was, it. <laughs> it's an, another great thing that came out of that project <laughs> yeah. i found my wife there so, oh, uh, that's so <laughs> nice. yeah. um but yeah i mean it's it was just a really pleasurable uh project yeah. and you know, th that one came about because um, I, another project that I guess I, I, I've done over the years, I, I've, I've tried to make it a consistent thing, but it, it get, it's hard to mm. it's hard to keep it going and mm -hmm. keep the funding coming. But I, I have a, a Hawaii Grazing and Livestock Management Academy that I do. And I, I um, and, and I had put together these binders and all this material and had taught a couple of these programs around mm -hmm. and you know the pacific island outreach project came about because glenn uh and i were talking about this hawaii grazing and livestock management Cad academy and he says you know he says you ought to do that for the pacific islands and uh so um with his encouragement and guidance um i went and found some funding for that through um the the first set of funding we had was from the socially disadvantaged farmer and ran rancher program. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time we were done, I, we had over a million dollars in funding uh, to do those different projects that we did out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, nice. it was a great project. I think that one was really pleasurable. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, as, as memorable, um, I, I think the that it, it's again, it's hard. And, yeah. I, and right now, this one is, you know, the Two Line Spittlebug Project mm -hmm. is is at the forefront of everything. Um, yeah. It's not a pleasure to do. I, I mean, right. I mean, I enjoy the work and I enjoy the research and I enjoy I enjoy the process of it all. But I I, I so wish this Two Line Spittlebug was not here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would rather not have this project. Um, yeah. <laughs> because this again. this pest is is. And in my in my viewpoint, this pest is as big as bad a problem as the rapid ohia death. Oh, and, okay. So and it, it, it is potentially going to be uh, devastating to the industry here. And oh my gosh, um, wow. there's there's so much work to do, and there's so much to learn about. Yeah. How to deal with this pest. Wow. And it's something that I feel like we've been hearing a lot about lately, like the two lines middle bug. And like my background is like econ and like business. 
but what exactly is it? And like, how does it affect everything? Like, you know, what is it and why is it so important? Yeah, so the, the two line spittle bug is a is an in, it's an insect. It, it's a it, it specifically feeds on grasses. So it's a very host specific uh, pest. So is it yeah. only so it's only specific types and varieties of grasses then? So it doesn't feed on it doesn't feed on trees or okay uh, flowers in your garden. It won't right. feed on vegetable plants. It feeds on grasses. What we're finding out is that. You know, some grasses are highly susceptible to its feeding. Other grasses tend, other grasses can be resistant to it. Yeah. And so we've been doing, we've been doing some research to figure out, you know, what the levels of resistance are in different types of grasses that occur mm -hmm. here in Hawaii uh, and some different varieties of grasses that um, are being developed in South America, where there's a lot of these grass feeding spittle bugs, not just oh. two line spittle bug, but different different species of spittle bug. And they are, they're dealing with that on a much bigger level than we are. Yeah. And because of that, they've, their approach to dealing with the spittle bug is to develop grasses that are both nutritious for livestock, and but are resistant to resistant. spittle bug feeding. And so we've, we've been, a, we've been able to cooperate with a couple different companies down in right. South America and bring in some of these different varieties for testing. And so, um, so the two line spittle bug, um, has two, has three phases. One is an egg. Uh -huh. uh, when the egg hatches, the nymph, which lives in a spittle mass at the base of the grass. So it's like somebody spit on the ground. That's what they live in. It looks just like that. That's why it's called a spittle mass. <laughs> yeah, and, sorry. I was like, for those of you listening, I just made a face and I was like, Ooh. Yeah, so it so but that's they, a perfect way to describe it because yeah, exactly no. what it looks like is it looks like a bunch of spit. <laughs> it's yeah. exactly what it is. And and actually it's her excrement. Yep. Oh so, so oh, even even, even more even better. Better. <laughs> right? so, so they basically they they basically suck up the fluids from the they the nymphs live off of the roots and they right. attach the roots and they they have a little proboscis that they inject into the plant and then they suck up the the fluids from the xylem tissue of the root and then they exude that out their rectum Here. and then they back into that and then they live in that and it oh protects God. them, keeps them from drying out, protects them from predators. Um, and this is all at the soil surface. So, uh, which is very important in distinguishing between other types of spittle bugs. We have some, uh, we have two other varieties of spittle bugs. Oh, we have more than one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but only the two line spittle bug causes damage to the grasses. Oh. The other two, the other two feed on different plants and they don't really cause any damage. They've been here for a long time, actually. Oh, okay. And uh, so they're, and they haven't caused any problems or damage, but the two line spittle bug um, yeah. is very damaging. So the nymphs go through five instar stages uh -huh. and then they, and then they become an adult and then the adults jump and they fly and they're black. They have two orange bands or red bands across mm -hmm. their back. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how you identify them. And, but the adults feed on the leaf material and they, they don't eat the leaves, but they, they inject their proboscis into the xylem tissue of the leaf and they suck on the fluid. Now, like that a vampire it, bug, basically. Like a, like a I mean, vampire. I, like, vampire. Like, I don't have the scientific, the same kind of scientific background you guys do, so I'm going to relate it to what I can think of. So. Right. Well, I mean, that's yeah. a, that's it. They're they're like a vampire bug, and they and yeah. so um, they're sucking the xylem fluid out. And but for them to be able to uh, utilize the xylem fluid, mm -hmm. which is high in carbohydrates. Oh, they okay. use they use an enzyme, yeah. uh, an enzyme um, that breaks down that uh, carbohydrates into simple yeah. sugars. And mm -hmm. in the process of doing that, and so they basically in, they basically inject that into the plant prior to it coming into their proboscis. Right. And the plant, the xylem tissue is moving fluid up and down that that right. leaf. It's pulling that enzyme up through the leaf material and down through the leaf, leaf material, right? So it's like directions. poisoning it at the same time, kind of. Essentially, yeah. essentially the, oh. the enzyme, uh, the enzyme is, 
basically poisoning the plant. What happens is, is that enzyme starts to break down the cell walls within the plant tissue, and then the cell breaks, and it's because it's in the leaf, it can no longer photosynthesize, and so it shuts down photosynthesis. If it's not photosynthesizing, wow. the carbohydrates are not getting to the root yeah. mass. And so right. what happens is the root masses start to die, and then you lose the whole plant if the yeah. feeding pressure is too high. Wow. And so that's what's happening. And it, so and I think is, it happens to all plants that way, it, all uh -huh. grasses that way when they feed. But some seem to be a little bit more resistant than others, or maybe the maybe the bug doesn't feed on them at as high a intensity mm -hmm. as they do. So Kukuyu grass and Pangola grass, yeah. uh, along with a couple others, have shown that they're very susceptible to the feeding of the spittle bug. So they're the cotton candy so, to the yeah. spittle bug, to the two line spittle bug, whereas some other variety might be spinach in a way, you know. So, yeah, okay, I mean, that's a, crop. That's a, it's a good way to 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 look at it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's the same for our livestock. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, Kukuyu and Pangola grass are our best forage grasses in the state. In fact, they- right. Well, yeah, they're really high nutrition content, I think, aren't they, or? Yes, yes, they are. I mean, uh, you know, Kukuyu grass can vary between 12 and almost 20% crude protein, yep. very mm -hmm. digestible, um, very good quality. I mean, at, at Mayalani, we're, we finish, we can finish cattle on, on that in 24 months, up to about 1200 pounds. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, the, so, and Kukuyu grass is extremely important in the state because- yeah. Um, yeah. you know, supporting probably anywhere from 60 to 75% of the cattle in the state. Yeah, right. And most of that is here in the Waimea oh, yeah. area. And there's mm -hmm. other islands have uh, areas of Kukuya grass too, but yeah. right now the spittle bug is only on the big island and right now only in the Kona area, but it's rapidly moving. So mm -hmm. it's, it's expanding its range by about 35,000 wow. acres a year. Whoa. And, yeah, wow, and so yeah, that's fast, and it's it's yeah. faster than we can adjust to it, right? Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and yeah. Well, so, and with like the limitations in terms of everything going on just in the last over a year now, and then like funding and stuff, I would imagine it it's, yeah. it's a hard thing to keep up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it. Well, and and that's the thing. I mean, it's it's not something we can keep up with. Yeah. I mean, it's it's moving at a pace that we can't you can't reestablish pastures fast enough and that, yes you know you can't exactly. replant and introduce new grasses into the systems mm -hmm. yeah. as fast as it's moving so yeah um you know we're trying to figure out different ways to to, to deal with it uh, to yeah. manage it um so and, it, can we take a step back you talked about the the adult bugs and i think that's an important part to talk about the adults and the mm -hmm. nips so because for folks folks to understand that um it's, you know, I always thought when we first started this, oh, the nymphs are going to cause the most damage to our grass, but it's actually not true, right? Because it's the adults that are actually causing the higher impact. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I think that um, I, I, there's some things that we just don't know about the past. And, you know, so I just back up even further. So, you okay. know, the two line spittle bug comes from the Southeast United States. It's native to that area. And they, they have known about this this uh grass feeding two-line spittle bug uh for a very long time there's there's data that goes back um into the 50s on the two-line spittle bug um the but and they've done some work with them but you know it, it was never the a major issue issue it was yeah just, that's what i was gonna it was say. enough for them to say well, okay well here's a problem these show yeah. up every so often and they become a pest but other times they're not a pest and they're right. just there and they're, you know, just sort of a background population. Um, is there like a natural predator in the mainland that there's not here? Kind of well, thing, I, you know, what happens know. is what I think happens is, is that in the Southeast United States, you still get cold winters. Yeah. You know, you, you can have frost and you can have snow and you can have the ground frozen. So the adults lay their eggs in the ground. Yeah. And I I think and then and then over winter the, the pest is uh in a diapause phase where they're not active and so the eggs stay in diapause and i think in i think in those cold winters you get a reduction in the population the eggs die they never hatch mm -hmm. so the next year's population is much reduced mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we don't have that situation here so what we have seen and what we've documented is that any yeah. area where you're at the population 
one year over the next increases exponentially. So we start with, we start with, you know, maybe the first outbreak is, you know, we find maybe 10 or 15 nymphs per square meter. The second generation, we might have 30 or 40, 40. nymphs per square meter. Then we go into diapause. The next year, what happens is, is that the population is now, you know, uh, close to 200 mm -hmm. nymphs per square meter, right? And all, I would say, probably 99% of those nymphs make it to adulthood. Oh, wow. And so when you have those high levels, so we have found that, for example, Kikuyu grass isn't damaged below about 60 nymphs per square meter. You know, it's just, there's some there's some damage, but it doesn't yeah. die off. It doesn't die. But if you get over 60 nymphs per square meter, we get a complete population crash of the Kikuyu grass. It completely oh. disappears from the system. You, you can't, there's no roots left. There's no, and oh, wow. kukui grass wow. is a very strongly rhizominous grass and right. it just disappears from the system. And so it's the adults that are doing the feeding and the damage. It, I think it's their feeding pressure because they feed off of the leaf material, right? And it's interfering right. with photosynthesis. The nymphs, I, th I think, still inject amylase, the, the enzyme, oh, in, okay. into the root, uh -huh. but because they're feeding off of the root, there's no da there's no photosynthesis stop in photosynthetic processing, right? Mm, it's right. the leaf feeding that causes the damage, right? Oh, I see. But at, at yeah. best, the nymphs cause maybe some water stress with the plant, right? Because they're mm -hmm. interfering with, with roots. fluids moving from the mm -hmm. roots up to the leaf material. Right. But because the leaves are important for photosynthesis, mm -hmm. when the when the feeding starts in there and those die back, that's where we get the death of the plants. Their, their injection of that amylase into that leaf material is killing that stopping that photosynthetic process. Wow. Yeah. It, it sounds like there are yeah. like there needs to, there's a lot of like research that still kind of needs to be done and and like projects related to that. So are you working uh, I'm assuming you're working on some. So what are some projects that related to two line spittle bug that you've been working on lately? Yeah, well a, a lot of our first initial efforts well um once we got the greenhouse up and, and going, yeah, uh, it took a lot of work to get the greenhouse in shape, but oh, yeah. um, uh, we started with looking at um, host uh, plant specificity. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to look at, at resistance of different grasses. So we had a, mm -hmm. an array of different grasses. Our graduate mm -hmm. student, Shannon Wilson, mm -hmm. done a tremendous uh, work on this project. She's done a really great job. Um, and, and so she looked at an array of different grasses and introduced uh, spittle bugs to those grasses and followed uh, them for a number of weeks to see how much damage right. um, they could take or how much feeding pressure they could take mm -hmm. uh, before they were damaged. And so we documented that uh, this the last year we documented that on a, a, a host of grasses that are uh, here in Hawaii um, mm -hmm. and are typical grazing plants. Um, and we compared that with a um, uh, uh, rack area uh, brisantha, which is uh, a variety called Marandu, um, mm -hmm. which has shown that it's got some resistance to spittlebug feeding. That. Mm -hmm. And, and as an aside, that particular grass is actually one, the grass that they're using as a foundation to develop um, other spittle bug resistant grasses. Oh, wow. And oh, good. so this year we're doing the same trials again um, to and, and comparing that with um, three grasses that come out of, well, actually four grasses that come out of mm -hmm. um, South America, uh, two from a company called Brer and Brug, um, mm -hmm. another, and, and other two grasses come out of a company called Seat, and they all have uh, spittle bug resistance to them. And then, and then we're doing another, uh, s another set of uh, grasses that are local here um, to, to figure out, you know, which grasses are going to be uh, resistant. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and the point of that is, is that when the Kikuyu grass goes out, Mm -hmm. um, that just opens up everything to a, a whole, an array of different kinds of weeds that come in weeds. and they, yeah. they populate very fast. You know, the first one that comes in typically is fireweed. Um, it can, you know, we've seen, we've seen the Kukuya grass cover go from 90% cover 
down to 2% cover. Right. Wow. And, that, and in that same process, we've seen fireweed go from 5% cover up to 90% cover <laughs> right. Wow. right? in that, in that process. So it's an, it's, it's almost an exact exchange for kukui grass for fireweed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And other areas, there's different weeds like pomacani. There's the, uh, there's mare's tail, there's balloon plant. There's all kinds of weeds that come yeah. in and some of them are just terrible. They're, they're worse than, you know, yeah. the, than is anything. two line spittle bug yeah. on all the islands or just big island or no nope, just the big island the big so island far right uh you know knock on wood i mean it just yeah. um, you know that it yeah. stays on the big island uh, and, and i don't wish that on the big island but uh you know we don't want it on the other islands and right, correct. you know we'd like to be able to stop it so right now it's just in the kona area okay. uh it's range right now is at about one hundred and eighty thousand acres um and, wow, but like I said, it's it's spreading at about 35,000 acres a year. Well, so, so I was going to ask, too. Yeah. So is it like one of those things, like if I'm driving, let's say I'm driving on the highway and I pick up two or three, like on my vehicle, just from whatever, or like a tour stops and takes a photo or like, is that a possibility to pick them up and spread them that way? Or like, yeah, it, it maybe, is a possibility. Not. It is a possibility. The thing about, you know, the nymphs for two line spittle bug, the nymphs aren't, they don't move very fast. They're very mm -hmm. slow. They don't, they're not going to attach themselves to something and take a ride. And they okay. kind of need their mass, their spittle yeah. mass as well. They need to have that oh. moisture to survive, right? So, right. Yeah, exactly. And so if they're outside of that spittle mass, they don't live very long. The adults are really skittish they jump and they fly and they're they don't sit still very long mm -hmm. they're hoppers um, yeah they mm -hmm. another name for them is frog hoppers frog right? hoppers because mm -hmm. they, they hoppers. jump around right mm -hmm. um so they're really skittish they they're not mm -hmm. gonna they're not gonna land on the hood of a pickup and ride 40 miles somewhere you know they're gonna yeah. jump off before you even get out of the pasture yeah, yeah. um the, so where the possibility that you could transport them, and this is what we need to get out to the community, is if you drive into, uh, into a pasture and you get out and your door is open, there's a yeah. possibility that an adult could fly in. And then mm -hmm. you shut the doors and they're inside. You and could transport one that way, right? Yeah, that's what I was but, wondering. Yeah. Yeah, it, but it's not likely. So if you're just driving down the highway, you're not going right. to pick up a two-line spittle bug yeah. at 60 miles an hour and carry them <laughs> for the next 40, right? It's not, not going to happen that way. But right? if you go to your neighbors and you have coffee and, like, you guys go check the cows together, I'm just thinking of my dad. Like, yeah. he'll go to my uncle's and like they'll go hang out and like look at the cows but yeah. then he'll go home and like my uncle will come over to my dad you know like that like is that a possibility of spreading it that way yeah it, it is right we have to we have to maintain that that is a possibility okay i think the probability of that is pretty low. low low okay i think the probability is low and and mainly because they're just too skittish i mean okay you know now i think some exceptions exist so right uh, we have seen um, adults that get down in the bed of a truck and, okay. and you know, where the air isn't moving and, and whatever, and, and, they, mm -hmm. and they've gone and they've hitched a ride for a short distance, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that, for example, somebody that takes a trailer into a pasture, a horse mm -hmm. trailer or something like that, that the bugs could get into that trailer, maybe get down into the bedding of the trailer or into a, you know, down on the floorboards or something mm -hmm. like that and, mm -hmm. and hitch a ride. Um, that's a possibility. They could hitch a ride inside the cab. Um, uh, they, they could hitch a ride, say, in some gear or something like that if they got yeah. in and got trapped, you know. Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to stay there. If you open it up in the field, they probably would fly yeah. out. That's yeah. not where they want to be. Right. Um, so, so that's that. Like I said, that's a possibility, but I think it's not as probable as okay. we expect. Well, that's, well, I mean, that's you know, good to know. Yeah, and we talked about this stuff with Janae the other, the last right. one was talking about biosecurity and whatnot on your farm. And this is, I yeah. think, one of the things that people have to consider if you have it on your place. Just be cautious, be aware. Um, check your gear if you can maintain that you have gear just for your farm. Use it just for your farm. 
checking your your trailers and stuff before you leave your place and if you know especially if you know you're going out to someone else's place you know to just be cautious of that that's that i think that's all part of our biosecurity and i think um going through this project i mean you know going out in the beginnings when we were first starting to do the surveys and now you see some uh, i see some of the images it's quite devastating to see these pastures that have gone like mark said from 90 percent kikuyu um to five percent kikuyu now in those some of those areas but I guess some of the other things, I mean, people have to think about those types of things as not trying to transport these bugs back and forth, right. you know, checking your gear and stuff, but also being cautious of, you know, what is, what, what's worries me, Mark. And what I think about is, oh, I'm going over to my pop's house, you know, and he's got this plant for me. He lives in an area that's got spittle and he's like, no, take this plant here, take this. I made this for you or whatever, you know, and you don't know what could be in that soil. So I think if you are in those areas, I mean, is that another concern? I mean, is that something else that people should think about moving other, you know, you're not, maybe they're not having livestock, but they live near areas that do have livestock pastures and the spittle is in that area. So. Yeah, I, I, that's an excellent point. point. LA, you, the biosecurity thing is that, you know, if you're in the Kona area and, uh, anybody in the Kona area. It doesn't matter if you're a rancher, if you're a homeowner, mm -hmm. everybody in the Kona area needs to do two things. One thing is be aware mm -hmm. of what two-line spittle bug is, that it's there. And the other thing is to be alert, you know, to, to understand that, you know, alert meaning you're, you're looking for yeah. it, right? You're paying attention yeah. to where that bug is. So you don't, accidentally trap it into your vehicle and carry it to Kona or to Waimea. So being aware and alert uh, to the presence of that bug, I think would go a long ways. I think the, th the third possibility for spreading this is actually the scariest and probably the one that will be the one that spreads this across the island. And that is eggs are laid in the soil and they can go into diapause. So they could be there and they're microscopic. The eggs are microscopic. You can't see them. You're not going to see them. You're not going to go through the soil and say, oh, there's an egg, right? Yeah. You, just, right. you can't you, you can't do that. You They're can't. microscopic. Mm -hmm. So it's possible and probable, more probable than transporting an adult. Mm -hmm. You know, an, just another quick point on the adults. They only live for two weeks. Yeah. So, you know, they, they have a very short lifespan. And, and in that two weeks, the female is going to lay about 200 eggs. Soil that could have... 200 eggs in it, you know, from one, one female. So mm -hmm. I think that the way it's going to get transported is that somebody's going to move plant material and mm -hmm. soil material from one, from Kona around the Island. And where I think it's going to happen, where the, where the biggest possibility is people that raise plants for, uh, for landscaping, you know, yeah. grass, they transport turf all over the Island. Now, I don't know if they have two line spittle bug. Some of the golf courses have already said that they've got two line spittle bug or they've, they've recognized two line spittle bug in the area. So moving plant material out of the Kona area is the way that I think is, is going to transport that. And right. you know, ranchers aren't pl transporting plant material, but the, the, the landscaping industry is. And so uh, that's, that's one that I'm really worried about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's, that's important, I think, for folks to think about, right? So we want to say that it's never going to get anywhere else, but we, we kind of know that in the end, eventually it will be around our island. So what other things, I guess, can we share with producers that maybe don't have it that can start to kind of think proactively about what they can do to lessen the impact if two-line spittle bug does come into their areas? What should they be thinking about at this point, right? Yeah, so, you know, so for, for ranchers where the two-line spittle bug is not at right now, now is again the first thing is just to be aware you know there's there's resources out there now that we've been putting out about two line spittle bug so there's pictures uh there's some presentations that talk about it that show mm -hmm. the adults that show mm -hmm. the nymphs um there's presentations out there that show what the damage looks like and how the damage mm -hmm. progresses through time one is really critical for the all livestock producers on the big island um, and the other islands. I mean, it got here that if it, if you're in an area, the bug is not there now. The first thing you mm -hmm. want to do is be aware. I educate yourself about what the bug looks like, what the damage looks like. Right. So that so you can be aware. So you can be scanning your pasture lands. And so when you and 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 to be alert to the possibility of damage in your pastures, if you mm -hmm. start to see dead patches of grass crop up where they shouldn't be, go take a look. And go take a look means get down off the, 
your horse or out of your pickup or off the four wheeler and dig down through the grass and look to see if there are spittle masses or to see if there's an adult, right. you know, living around in, yeah. in the area. If you, if you have a brown patch of grass and that's where spittle bugs have been feeding, it's because the adults are feeding in that column of grass. They feed at the leaf, they go down to the bottom and they lay their eggs. They come up and they feed and they lay their eggs. They don't move because as long as the grass is green, there's good feed there. Right, By the yeah. time the patch is brown and dead, they've laid all their eggs, the adult has died, and down below is going to be the nymphs. And that's what you got to look for. If you see if you see dead grass and you identify two-line spittlebug in your pastures, mm -hmm. give me a call. And let's have a conversation about, you know, how big the area is, where the area is at. One, I want to document that so that we can right. track the spread of this pest. Uh, so that we can warn people of, in advance. It's That's really what we want to do is be able to tell people, look, it's here. Right. You should be being prepared for this. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, some management tactics that you can use to try to get the population under control mm -hmm. and prevent it from getting to a point where, um, you know, it's going to wipe out your pastures. You know, yeah. so there's some different types of management decisions. There's We have some grazing management recommendations pesticides that uh, are labeled for pasture and will kill adult spittle bugs. But again, the, it's really important that, uh, and I, you know, we're, we're cautious about telling people to utilize pesticides, mainly because the pesticides are broad scale. They, they kill all insects. Okay. They don't just yeah. kill the spittle bug. So right. they'll kill all the beneficial insects yeah. too. Yep. And if you see one spittle bug and you're tempted to go out and spray an entire pasture you, you, you don't know if you're, you know, killing enough of the adults uh, to warrant the cost of the pesticide, right? Right, right. So you've got to know what the population is and how much area you're going to actually spray if you're going to do that. And it's got to be targeted. So, you know, we if we're recommending pesticides, it's targeted um, and uh, strategically used. And, and so, but grazing management, can be applied there's we have some protocols for that but other than that right now we just don't have any other right. major tools uh, mm -hmm. to to deal with this right so well, if mm -hmm. the population comes and the pasture is destroyed then then there's other things that have to be other mm -hmm. steps that have to be done yeah i think well yeah and like you said there's i think still a lot more to be learned about um, how you're going to manage the two lines bit of bug and just how it's going to manage itself here in our climates and in our pastures. Maybe we can mitigate the loss somehow, right? One thing I do want you to maybe talk a little bit about is you are developing a app, correct? Yeah, right. yeah. We're, I was, I was actually, we've been working on a, a smartphone application that'll be nice. available through Apple and Google Play. I wanted to build into it several different things. One, I wanted to be able to I wanted users to be able to be in the field, be able to take a picture, uh, geolocate uh, a spittle bug that yeah. then would that would they would be able to log that information. They would have a map. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about from the rancher's perspective. I mean, if you're on your ranch and you go out and you identify an area that's got two line spittle bug, you could click it, take a picture and it would geo reference that. And then you could, you know, in the app, you can write some notes about it and you can talk, you know, uh, set up you know, how much area is being damaged. Uh -huh. um, and there's several steps there, but it would all be logged into your, your use for your use. You'll be able to see mm -hmm. your map, your mm -hmm. ranch. And, but for us, it would come into a program where we could on a, on a full scale, we could, we could track the movement. So right. we could get movement vectors for this spittle bug. So we could predict when it's going to reach a certain area mm -hmm. um, right. so that we could, preempt it maybe and and do some uh management tactics that maybe would right. diminish the impact of the pest before it got there uh so that's one aspect of the app is is the ability to um geo reference map and identify uh two line spittle bug one part of the app is just going to be informational this is two line right. spittle bug and here's how it's different from these other two so you can go through a process and positively identify two line spittle bug mm -hmm. Um, and distinguish between the others. Um, one is just informational in terms of giving uh, basic ecology and biology of the two-line spittlebug. Mm -hmm. um, 
but probably the more important aspect is it'll have a management decision support tool uh, mm-hmm. built into that. So what will what the the ability of the app then would be to it will take you through some uh, uh, protocols to basically determine um, how big the population is, uh-huh. how big the population will be when the adults emerge, mm-hmm. and then predict sort of windows of time when you are at the greatest risk of damage. Oh. And, and it all will be based off of the nymphs, the age of the nymphs. We're grouping them into three, three age classes mm-hmm. so that we can then provide windows of time so if you're if your population is primarily in the first and second instar stages Mm -hmm. um then you know you've got somewhere between uh 50 and 40 days before you start to see the emergence of adults that are at a level that are going to cause a significant amount of damage on the other hand if if they're all in instars three and four then you've got somewhere between 20 and 10 days before they move you get uh you get to the point where you're going to have significant damage. So you could start figuring out what that window of time is that you're Mm -hmm. at most vulnerable for damage, right? By, by tracking that population. So are you at a point of beta testing potentially yet? Or like even. Oh no, no, no. We're so crafting it. (laughs) Right now the app is still, I'm I'm working with a company. Um, They're doing all of the stuff. I'm just providing all the information. Nice. I think. I think we're probably looking at some time in the fall before this is actually going to be ready. Developing an app is a lot and kind of given all that you want it to do in terms of track tracking and then to get the information so that you can do the the simulation models and get predictions. I was like, that's going to be awesome though, because potentially that could help a lot of people in terms of management. Well, and that's Mm -hmm. the thing, you know, so, so we wanted something for the ranchers as a tool for them. So if they're going out and they're spending the time to look for the school club, they can document the population right. size and then they can, they can plan, they can plan their grazing around that. They can plan right. their, their management tactics around that. We have a whole series of recommendations based on mm-hmm. whatever level of population and damage class that they're going to be in. Um, and that could be right. mapped across their ranch. So they could look at, at their whole ranch and they could look at wherever the spittle bug is at they could plan their grazing to go and impact those areas um, there. So I think it'll be a powerful tool. Um, It's going to require some training to use. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to require some beta testing. So (laughs) you're going to be trying to enlist, uh, you know, ranchers to, to try it out. Mm -hmm. I think really in in and one important point, I think out of all of this is that the two line spittle bug, and we're talking about the ranches being impacted, and, and I, I really want to stress that this is not just a rancher problem. Mm-hmm. This is a problem yeah. that belongs to the state. Yeah. yeah this is cause... a problem that affects everybody in Hawaii. If you're concerned about food security in this state, yeah. then you should be concerned about the Certainly. two-line spittle bug. If you're right. concerned about the natural resources in this state, then you need to be concerned Cons- about the two-line spittle bug. That's mm-hmm. right. if, you, if you are thinking about you know, all of the ecosystem services that we get from our landscapes, then you need to be concerned about the two-line spittle bug. Right. This is not just a rancher problem. It's affecting ranch land because that's where we discovered it first, but it's also right. affecting natural resource areas, that uh, forest reserve areas. Uh, it's affecting lawns, land, uh, homeowners. Well, that's what I was going to say. You had even mentioned like nurseries and golf courses yeah. and stuff. And I was like, I mean, tourism is like the number one industry in the state, you know, so. So, so. If you're in this state, you need to be concerned about yeah. two-line spittlebug. Bottom right. line, um, it, it, it it's that level of, of concern mm-hmm. that we need to have in this state. And I think, and, and the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council, by the way, has been doing an outstanding job pushing the importance of activity, action on the two-line mm-hmm. spittlebug. And to and I, I think the legislature has jumped on board. They, they've you know, it's moved through the House. It's in the Senate. I'm not sure exactly where the bill is, but there's a bill for two-line spittlebug mm-hmm. uh, to provide funding from for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture yeah. uh, to support management and uh, research and activities to get this spittlebug under control. Mm-hmm. Um, so, th- so the legislature's on board, and Hawaii Cattlemen's right. Council has done an a- absolutely outstanding. Nicole Galassi, I just got to 
say her name because she's done an outstanding job pushing those issues yeah. and and keeping yeah. that at the forefront of the industry and of the legislature so yeah. you know this is this i'll just you know it's not just a rancher problem it's a state problem right. and everybody yeah. ought to be concerned about it so much more that we could talk about with the two line spittle bug let me tell you there's so much yeah. um so much more that we could talk about but thank it's you just so like much. that's a lot of information i feel yeah. like we kind of need to have a follow-up episode at some point so. in the future with mark about yeah. this <laughs> definitely like especially when you get your app going and um yes, ready to launch exciting. that you definitely should have you come back and talk more about it but yes. thank you um, very much for joining us today mark um is there anything else you want to share with anybody about the takeaways you have from the project with the two line spittable I, I think the biggest takeaway I, I think is you know for the ranchers be aware be alert get educated about it and we're trying to provide as much information out there as we can nrcs uh, carolyn wong uh, has been putting mm -hmm. out some videos um and stuff so I, I i think we're trying to get the information out so that we get enough as many people as, as possible to be aware and and alert to the spittle bug biggest thing is that uh, i just said it earlier it's not a rancher problem it's a state problem everybody's yeah. got to be on board right everybody's got to be contributing right. to the solution for this thing we're going to lose our ranch lands we're going to lose our pastures yeah. if we don't get if we don't get on top of this thing and 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 it, it's a lot of work to do there's a lot of things mm -hmm. there to do and we're trying to do as as much as we can uh with the funding that we have um and and learn about it so that we've got some you know management objectives i think, I think those are the things you know if you don't have it right now be alert be aware get educated if you are not a rancher it's still your problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Care about food security. I think that's, that's the right. big thing is, is that even yeah. if you're not a rancher, it's still, it's still an issue and everyone should be yeah. aware yeah. if you live here. Yeah, definitely. It's an issue. Definitely. And especially if you're in those areas that are already impacted and you know, you have just because you're a homeowner, it doesn't mean that you, you could not transport these things around the Island or it doesn't yeah, mean it's not going to impact you either. So yeah. Yep. Um, yep. that's an important thing. Well, thanks so much, thanks, Mark, Mark, for, I, you know, I here. thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed yeah. it. This was good just to have a conversation <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I'm, congratulations to you guys for getting this thing off the ground. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really proud of you guys. Get it and, off the ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We appreciate so, it. Yeah, yep. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. And thank you to everybody for listening. Uh, make sure to join our Facebook page, the Livestock Extension Group, if you haven't already. And be sure to visit the UH CTAR Extension website and our YouTube channel listed in the show notes for additional information and links to the web. For more information about this topic, you can see the Hawaii Rangelands website, which will also be listed in our show notes of the podcast and the de description box of our YouTube page. Uh, thanks for listening to the Livestock Balaao. Before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. Then stay tuned for next month's podcast. Thanks, everybody. Ahoy ho. Till next time. Thanks. Mahalo.